Hello, and welcome to the fourth installment of the 2016 INSAR Summer Institute. I'm Carolyn McCormick, co-chair of the INSAR Student and Training Committee and a postdoc at Brown University. The INSAR Summer Institute is a six-course online series presented by the International Society for Autism Research. The goal of the Summer Institute is to provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of autism-related research topics that is accessible for people new to the field. The Summer Institute was originally motivated by and conceptualized for early career researchers, specifically graduate students and postdocs, but it's open to all those interested in autism research. We hope that the Summer Institute provides an opportunity for scientists with different backgrounds and from around the world to learn from each other and ultimately advance our understanding of autism. The Summer Institute sessions are free for everyone to attend live and available to, the in, to INSAR members for replay through their My INSAR account. This is the second year we're offering this training opportunity and the theme for the presentations is Familial Aspects of Autism. Today is our fourth session in the series and features a presentation from Dr. William Mandy, who will be talking about parent, or, or sorry, will be talking about sex differences um, in autism. Know that there are background materials for today's talk. If you haven't already, you can download these now at autism-insar.org. These materials define some of the key terms and provide suggested reading in the literature. As with all of the Summer Institute sessions, a group of trainees worked with Dr. Mandy to prepare, to prepare these course materials. The working group was led by Marika Kaufman, a doctoral student at Virginia Tech. Other members of the working group who contributed to today's session are Laura Hull, a doctoral student at the University of College London, um, Laura Anderson, a doctoral student at the University of Maryland, and Legia at oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I'm butchering her name, Antizana, a doctoral student at Virginia Tech. Before we started, know that you can ask questions uh, for Dr. Mandy at any time. We will be plenty of time for discussion during the second hour of the session. Ask a question at any time using the chat window on the, left of, on the bottom left of your window of your screen, and we'll get to as many of them as possible during the discussion period. At the very end of the session, we're going to leave a few minutes to talk about career development. If you want to get some advice about career development topics from Dr. Mandy, please post your questions in the chat window, and we will incorporate them in our discussion. We greatly appreciate feedback from attendees. When you end your session, please take a few moments to tell us about your experience today in the comments section. Um, now I'd like to hand this over to Marika Kaufman. Thanks for joining us and welcome. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for participating in the webinar today. I am Marika Kaufman and I am a graduate student at Virginia Tech like Carolyn just mentioned. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. William Mandy. Dr. Mandy is a senior lecturer in clinical psychology at the University College of London and honorary clinical psychologist at the National Center for High Functioning Autism at Great Ormond Street Hospital. His research interests include the assessment and conceptualization of high functioning autism, executive functioning in ASD, autistic traits in non-autistic populations, neurodevelopmental risk factors for anorexia nervosa, the impact of ASD at school, social communication impairment is a risk factor for conduct problems, and evaluating clinical and educational interventions aimed at supporting people with ASD. He's also interested in sex differences in ASD, and that's what he will be presenting on today. So without further ado, I want to hand the floor over to Dr. Mandy for his presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thanks very much to all of the team uh, for inviting me. I'm incredibly pleased to be part of this excellent seminar series that INSAR um, ha has organized. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about girls and women on the autism spectrum. And before I uh, get started, I'd just like to sort of reiterate the, po the point made by Karen that this was very much a team effort. Uh, so you'll notice there are some really useful background materials. There's been a lot of technical thinking that's gone into this presentation, and that was a whole team of people uh, who's worked together in order to uh, make this webinar possible. So thank you very much uh, to them. So uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to have a very brief introduction to uh, autism spectrum conditions. I'm assuming that most people have uh, a bit of knowledge about autism, but I thought I'd just make a few basic points by way of introduction. And you may notice that I'm using the term autism spectrum condition rather than autism spectrum disorder. Uh, 
So that's the first thing I want to say about that is I'm, I'm just using it as a direct synonym. Um, so when I say AFC, I am talking about the diagnostic entity that's described in DSM-5 and is called autism spectrum disorder. But the reason I prefer to use ASC rather than ASD is really in reflection of the sort of growing neurodiversity movement uh, in autism as a way to uh, signal uh, that I recognize that autism comes with both strengths as well as difficulties, and that arguably labeling it uh, inherently as a disorder doesn't sort of convey that. So I'm going to be talking about ASC rather than ASD. Um, so after that introduction, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, the, um, the gender ratio in ASC. And you'll notice I've used this term sex slash gender ratio in ASC. So I, I think I should also explain why I'm using that slightly odd and admittedly slightly clumsy term rather than just saying the sex ratio or, or, or the gender ratio. So you'll be aware, of course, that sex refers to someone's biological status as a male or a female, whereas gender describes their socially constructed roles and attributes given to males and females. And the point is that when we look at differences between girls and boys with autism or men and women with autism, we don't yet have the research designs to tell us whether, when we do observe um, differences, to what extent those are sex differences, i.e. Uh, biologically influenced differences, and to what extent any differences we observe are actually gender differences, things that really reflect more kind of cultural, socio-cultural factors. So I'm borrowing this term from, from Meng Shuang Lai, um, who wrote a very good review on this whole topic, which is, which is on a reading list, and I'm, I'm using the term sex slash gender uh, to convey the fact that when we observe differences between males and females, we're not yet at the stage where we can tease apart to what extent they're kind of biologically driven and to what extent they're culturally driven. Okay, well anyway, I'm going to talk about the male to female ratio in autism, and that's going to lead me into a discussion of whether there's a diagnostic bias against females with the condition. I'm then going to go on to talk about the characteristics of females with autism, uh, and in particular to talk about something called the female autism phenotype, uh, and then we're going to go on to think about the impact that this phenotype can have on diagnosis, uh, the impact it can have on a girl or a woman's chances of being identified as having autism in a timely way. And we'll finish off by thinking about the future, thinking about where this field uh, might be going. Okay, so what is autism? Well, currently, our answer to that question is to describe a bunch of observable kind of signs and symptoms, you know, which is to say that autism, uh, like pretty much any other mental disorder in DSM-5 that you care to mention, uh, is defined in terms of observable signs and symptoms. And in the case of autism, there are basically two types of symptoms uh, that we look for when we're deciding whether or not somebody has the condition. We have the social difficulties of autism, um, which is uh, shown by this box here, problems of social reciprocity, problems of social communication, friendship, conversation, eye contact, so on and so on. And then we have this other cluster of symptoms, the non-social elements of autism. So these are difficulties with flexibility, uh, uh, the tendency to be quite focused in one's interests, uh, sensory, having sensory abnormalities, uh, unusual sensory processing, and so on. Now, I think it's always worth reminding ourselves uh, when we're thinking about how much we know about autism and how much we don't know about autism, is that whilst we define it as a behavioral level, we don't actually know um, what um, the sort of underlying uh, sort of atypicality of brain structure and function is that gives rise to these observable behaviors, observable signs and symptoms, which is another way of saying, uh, you know, in medical language, we say we don't know what the autism disease entity is. So at the moment, we're still conceptualize autism uh, by its kind of manifestations rather than understanding what the thing itself is. Uh, we have no biomarkers for autism. Okay. Another important feature about autism is that it increasingly comes to being understood as a dimensional disorder. So previously, probably you know, during the 1990s and even at the beginning of this century, it was quite commonly thought of as a categorical uh, condition. So something you had or you didn't have. In the same way that Down syndrome is a categorical condi condition. You either have Down syndrome or you don't have Down syndrome. Uh, but what people realized when they went out into the general population and they gave uh, large samples, measures of how many autistic symptoms they had, they found no evidence 
contrast between these gender ratios uh, tells us something quite important, and I'd like to illustrate it with this. So think about clinical samples. Samples where somebody has been referred to a clinic, received an assessment, and been diagnosed. As I said, you get perhaps one, for every one female, you get um, four males, uh, or even, in fact, uh, in many samples like science simplex, you get six males for every one female. Uh, and as I also said, in non-referred samples, and samples where you haven't waited for people to be referred, but you've gone out and actively sought uh, cases of autism, males and females, you get two male females for every six males, you have a gender ratio, a sex gender ratio of, of three to one. And so what that tells us is that there are females out there in the community, uh, signified here by this, this female with a, a sort of green ring around her, there are females out there in the community who, who if you assess them properly for autism, would meet criteria. But for some reason, they're not getting into clinics. They're not getting into clinical samples. And to me, that's pretty clear evidence that there is um, a, a diagnostic bias uh, against females with um, with autism. But there's actually, uh, we can take this even a little bit further by going back to this point I made earlier about autism being a dimensional condition. So what happens if we don't say, we don't look at the gender ratio, the male to female ratio for people who have autism, who meet diagnostic criteria for autism, but rather we look at the diagnostic criteria for people who are high trait scorers, people who have very high scores on measures of autistic traits. Well, What's intriguing is that we get an even lower male-female ratio if we do that. We find actually, if we look at people with highly elevated autistic traits, you find only two males for every female. Um, so that's intriguing. You know, so, so we're finding that there's this group of females who have um, very high um, levels of uh, autistic traits, real profound difficulties with social life, with flexibility, but they aren't necessarily meeting criteria for autism as commonly as their male counterparts are. And there's direct evidence for that in these studies here from Ginny Russell uh, and from uh, Torzynski and Fran Francesca Happe and that group showing that if you're female and you have high, high autistic traits, you're less likely to receive a diagnosis uh, on the autism spectrum compared to a male. And indeed you need sort of often need additional problems, you know, perhaps with IQ or with behavior to kind of push you over that diagnostic threshold. So again, if we return to this idea, this is referred, uh, non-referred sample, so this is the three to one statistic, this idea that if you assess people in the community, you get three males to one female, uh, whereas this expresses high trait scorers. Uh, and what's clear uh, from this is that if you think about high trait scorers, uh, for every three females who score up with high traits in, in this diagram here, um, you find one is likely to make it into a clinic, Another one would meet criteria that wouldn't make it to a clinic, and a third um, wouldn't even meet diagnostic criteria despite having a very high autistic trait. So let me just pull that together. Um, what I think I've, what I, what I've sought to present here is evidence, clear evidence for the under ascertainment of females with ASC. That compared to males, females with ASC are uh, less likely. Uh, than equivalent males to receive uh, a, a diagnosis. Uh, and I would say that um, we have two forms of bias that are operating here, judging by how what we've seen in, in comparing these various gender ratios. First, there seems to be a bias against this group of females who would meet criteria, they'd meet full diagnostic criteria for autism, but for some reason or other, they're either not making it into clinics or when they get into clinics, they're not being properly assessed. Uh, and then you've got this other bias, this other sort of barrier, and this other group of females who have high autistic traits, really high autistic traits, but for one reason or another, even if you assess them for autism, they don't meet criteria. Yeah. So when we think of the, the, the under ascertainment of females in ASC, I think it's helpful to break it down into those two types of barrier, those two types of bias. And this represents a, um, a serious inequity in our healthcare system. You know, because one assumes that if females are being missed or they're being diagnosed late or they're being misdiagnosed, they are likely to be missing out on a timely and appropriate support uh, and care. Yeah. So it's something we need to understand, it's something we really need to get to grips with as a field. So how can we understand uh, this, this bias, this under -ascertainment? 
because of course if we want to reverse it, we need to understand it first. And the common answer that people give when asked why is there um, a diagnostic bias against females uh, is this one, which is that there's something about females with autism that is uh, on average somewhat distinct from males with autism. And for that reason, they don't necessarily fit our current diagnostic criteria or our current clinical referral methods, which are largely set up and sent more sensitive to male cases. Yeah. This is an increasingly influential idea, and it's that uh, that I'm now going to go on and talk about and to expand upon, because I'm going to talk about the individual characteristics of females uh, with ASC. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about this, this hypothesis, really, that there's a female autism phenotype. There's a female typical manifestation of autism uh, that is meaningfully distinct from a male typical manifestation and which can lead to under-recognition um, of, of, uh, of females with the condition. And before I get stuck into that, I do just want to make one thing clear, which is I don't wish to be making crude generalizations here. Uh, so when I talk about certain features of the female autism phenotype, I'm really not meaning to suggest that you know, all females with autism are this way, all males with autism are that way. Um, those are unhelpful generalizations, and they're just not borne out by the data. Uh, but rather, uh, I'm talking about tendencies, you know, tendencies for females to be more likely to have one type of characteristic, tendencies for males to have um, uh, another type of characteristic, although, of course, there's, there's much blurring uh, in between. So I'm going to go on to talk about um, four key features of the female autism phenotype. And I've selected these on two bases, really. One is I think they're important. You know, in my kind of reading of the literature and my clinical experience, I think they are the big four, really, in terms of the female autism phenotype. But I've also tried to err on the side of, of, of picking things that are evidence-based wherever possible, because one thing you'll notice about the field of uh, autism sex gender differences, is that there's a lot of stuff that's based on anecdote, clinical wisdom, personal testimony of parents or, or autistic people, uh, and there's, there's less knowledge that's been generated empirically uh, you know, using the scientific method. So we need to be careful about distinguishing between reasonable hypotheses that are based on um, observation, clinical, uh, clinical experience, personal testimony, etc., and uh, if you like, to put it uh, you know, slightly naively, but the facts, things that have been established um, empirically. So, let's start with what I consider to be the first key feature of the female autism phenotype, which is higher social motivation. So, there's this idea that certainly fits with my um, clinical experience that, on average, female autism are more interested in the social world than are males. And there's some evidence of that uh, from Rachel Hiller's work, you can see referenced here, where she found that um, parents and teachers reported that girls with autism were much more likely to initiate uh, relationships, and particularly friendships, um, and to be interested in friendships than were boys with autism. It's interesting, it's, it's worth noting, but what she didn't find was that the girls were better at maintaining those friendships. Uh, that's a different issue. That's not so much from social motivation, that's, that's something else. But in terms of their desire to initiate friendships, that was greater in females. And Alex Head um, found a similar finding in adults with autism. So again, she discovered that females were more likely to report being interested in friendship, having satisfying and meaningful friendships than did um, autistic males. So fairly good evidence that there is higher social motivation uh, in females uh, than, than males with autism. Now, a sort of related feature of a phenotype uh, is this. So, a key part of autism is, is that many people with a condition have this very uh, tendency to have to develop very 
and out of female. So the female interests uh, are thought to be more uh, socially focused, but also more sort of typical in quality. So I've met many females of autism who are really interested in, in animals, in, um, in fashion, uh, in, um, in novels and films and so on, in a way that has a sort of autistic intensity, but which is in no sense obviously sort of unusual or, or, or odd in terms of the actual topic. But I think it's more common for males to pick things um, that do stand out a bit more as, as seeming odd and therefore seeming obviously um, autistic. And, and there is some evidence in Rachel Hiller's work from that. Now, I'm going to take this opportunity to play you a couple of videos because um, I think in a broad sense they illustrate something about the female phenotype, you know, it, its subtlety. Uh, but also, I hope, because they convey some of what I've just been talking about, about higher social motivation and about how um, some females or women of autism can have quite socially directed obsessional um, interests and how these can actually sometimes be uh, dysfunctional for them. So we're going to see a clip of a, of a girl who came to our clinic in London when she was about nine, uh, participating in the ADOS, and then you're going to see a clip of her when she was older. So she came back and she uh, kindly agreed to sort of talk to us about, about autism. Uh, so it's a kind of little mini longitudinal vignette you're about to have here. Uh, so let's have a go playing this. So I'm going to ask Holly here about her friendships. Okay, so what, what, have you got a best friend? Mm. Four best friends. Yes. What are their names? Uh, Lauren, Ellie, Emma, and Paige. Right. And what do you like to do with your friends? Uh, I don't know. Have you got a favourite thing to do? No. So you don't. Do you like to watch TV and cuisines together? Or mm -hmm. Chat to them? Is that anything? No, not really. Not really. What would you say if you were at school and it was playtime? Mm -hmm. What would you do with your friends? So, did you get to know them at school? Did you meet them? Yeah. Yeah? No, I've got to... I've got to meet, meet, meet Lauren at play school. Gosh, it's a long time ago, isn't it? Mm. Mm. And what does being a friend mean to you? I don't know. It's a really difficult question, that one, isn't it? Mm. Let me see if I can explain it a bit better. If I was to ask you, how a friend might be different to somebody you just know at school. What would you say to that? Don't know. Try to think about it. Can you think of any ways they might be different? Okay, so that was her um, when she was. Um, nine or so when she came to our clinic and obviously from that clip it, it wouldn't be clear whether or not she had autism but she did actually receive a diagnosis after a, you know, a thorough multidisciplinary assessment. Uh, so now let's catch up uh, with this person in her um, early 20s as she's trying to kind of make the transition into um, a more sort of adult and independent life. My first year at secondary school, everything was normal. I fitted in. I had friends. I think half the time I even forgot I had anything wrong with me. Just carried on um, with life as normal, and I just thought this was going to be my life from now on. But I was wrong. So I became obsessed with a teacher, and um, my mother just thought I had a crush on two women, but it wasn't really like that at all. But and then I started to cut myself mainly for attention because everyone was saying I was all right but I wasn't all right and I was fed up of saying it and I thought if I left a, a few suicide notes around the house for my mum to find then people start realising how serious it was. And um, I was in the kitchen, I was cutting fruit for the children and one of the, the deputy managers, she was really nice, she came in and just asked me what was wrong and I said that I used to cut myself when I was stressed of course I was holding a knife so she must have thought you know that I was some kind of ex-murderer so she went and told the owner and the manager and they said that 
I wasn't allowed back until I had full medical history clarifying that I was a half decent human being. So, yeah, and then the next chapter starts. I went to see my GP. She was quite a nice girl. So I decided just to get an obsession with her instead, um, which got really bad. Um, I don't know why I was obsessed with her. She was quite nice. She's a lot older than my mum, which was a bit weird, but I guess you don't choose these people. Um, yeah, and she, it got really bad with her. In the end, I started stalking her on the internet, stalking at family on the internet, etc., etc., etc. And in the end, I said that I couldn't be with her anymore because. Okay, so yeah, I think I hope that gives you a flavour of um, somebody who, in, in some senses, is really quite socially oriented, um, and you know, some, in some ways, her uh, kind of um, some sort of autistic characteristics and her and her social orientation slightly interact in unhelpful ways at times, such as this sort of almost sort of slightly stalking like behaviour that, that she describes there. Now so far I've very much talked, I've been in, we've really been in the realm of anecdote here, haven't we? I've been talking about clinical examples and showing you these videos of um, or, or, or to make this point that uh, female autistic interests are more socially oriented and, and, and their ones are less so. I have a little bit of data that I can present you on this topic. It's preliminary, but I hope you'll find it interesting. This is from a study by Rachel Looms, who's a, a clinical psychology doctor student here at UCL, whose project I, I supervise. And she's been designing a coding frame for capturing certain hypothesized elements of the female autism phenotype in ADOS videos. So in these assessment videos that are done in a standardized way, She's designed a coding frame that you can re-watch these videos and attempt to code for different aspects of the female phenotype so that you can then test the idea that these will be more common in female, the ADOS is of females than the ADOS is of males. Uh, and this coding frame is, is reliable, so it's good to rate reliability on it. And she has so far applied it to 44 ADOS tapes, uh, modules 3s and 4s, for those of you who know the ADOS, people in the age between 9 and 15 years, mean IQ of 101, so it's a high-functioning sample. And I'm just going to tell you about one of her findings here, which is she has one code that captures the content of people's focused interests. And fundamentally, this code assigns, it has two values. One is that that interest is social in nature, uh, that it either concerns living things, animals or people, uh, or, you know, and or, it's, it's an activity that takes place in a social context that's shared and done with other people. Uh, or interests can be coded as fundamentally physical in nature. They're more uh, sort of mechanical pursuits and or activities that are done alone, uh, it, 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 uh, not as part of a kind of social uh, interaction. And when she coded the interests for people in her sample, uh, she found this intriguing gender difference. So the males, if you look here, um, the males were less likely to so this column is, is people who, who were coded as having a social interest. The males are less likely to be coded as having social interests, but really their autistic interests were more likely to be assigned this physical code, the trains, roller coasters, computers, science, video games, so on and so on. Whereas by contrast, the females in her sample were more likely to be identified as having a kind of socially focused special interest, you know, be it animals, be it dancing, um, sort of reading books about people and so on, uh, and were less likely to have these kind of physically focused interests. And there was, even in this small sample, there was a significant difference between the groups. So some preliminary evidence for that terms of the phenotype, although well, clearly more work is, is required there. So I mentioned earlier that autism very rarely occurs in isolation, that it's almost always accompanied by this range of additional emotional behavioural, cognitive, neurodevelopmental difficulties, co-occurring problems. And a prominent idea in the female autism phenotype literature is that there's a different constellation of risk associated with autism, depending on whether you're male or female. And to put it broadly, the idea is that females with autism tend to be more vulnerable to so-called internalising problems, anxiety, depression, uh, whereas males with autism are more vulnerable to externalizing problems.
track with conduct, ADHD, um, oppositional defiant behavior, uh, and so on. And what many of you would have noticed from that, of course, is that this reflects a general population sex gender difference. Uh, and actually, that's a, a sort of issue that I think hovers over this whole field. You know, people haven't really addressed it enough yet, which is when we observe uh, differences between males and females on the autism spectrum, to what extent do those differences just reflect sex gender differences in the general population, uh, or to what extent are they particular to autism? It's often not investigated, um, and, and hopefully it will be increasingly investigated in the future work in this area. But thinking about the female phenotype as it applies to co-occurring difficulties, I'd like to focus on one particular area here today, which is the topic of eating disorders, because I think this is probably one of the best research areas, researched areas of the female phenotype that we have at the moment, uh, and also is, is very clinically uh, important. So we're going to take a quick diversion uh, into um, uh, another area, which is that of eating disorders, and particularly the sort of the, the archetypal restricted eating disorder, anorexia nervosa. So this is diagnosed so a person becomes significantly underweight due to restricted eating, uh, reflecting an intense fear of putting on weight and a distorted body image. Um, onset is typically in adolescence and early adulthood, and it affects many more females than males. Uh, so female to male ratio is as high as 10 to 1. Uh, and it's actually a, a very dangerous disorder. It has uh, I think the highest rates of mortality uh, out of any mental disorder. Uh, so, you know, a very serious uh, clinical problem. So on the surface, you might think, well, this looks very different from autism. Um, you know, it's an eating problem. It doesn't seem to have much to do with socializing and flexibility. It's got an adolescent onset, whereas autism uh, is basically present since birth and emerges in the first few years of life. Um, it affects more females than males whereas autism affects more males than females. And you might say, what on earth has this got to do with autism? Well, intriguingly, people who were working with uh, mostly women who had anorexia, uh, but who also had knowledge of autism, began to notice a certain overlap between the two conditions. In particular, um, Professor Chris Gilberg, who, who's here in this picture here, and his colleagues in Sweden, uh, formed this idea from clinical observation that a certain proportion of the young women who they were seeing with anorexia nervosa appeared to be, um, uh, or appeared to have troubles of social communication, troubles of social reciprocity, inflexibility, even sensory processing difficulties. Uh, in short, they appeared to be autistic. Uh, and they formed this hypothesis that maybe in females, uh, autism is a real risk factor for the development of anorexia. Uh, and this is an idea that they've tested, and that also um, a group of researchers, including Peter Chanchuria at the Institute of Psychiatry, have, have researched extensively. So Gilbert and colleagues did a cohort study. They followed up uh, 50 women uh, over uh, recruited in adolescence and followed up into adulthood who had anorexia nervosa, and they assessed them for autism regularly, and found very very high rates. So. Um, based on sort of prolonged assessments, Gilbert and colleagues identified um, about a quarter of their sample as meeting criteria for autism or an autism spectrum condition. So incredibly high, incredibly high rates of autism in this population. If you think what the rate of autism is in the general population of verbally fluent, intelligent women, uh, you know, that's a pretty low, it's less than a third of a percent. Uh, so the C rates of 25% in a population of women of this type is certainly uh, very striking and, and would lend evidence to the notion that maybe anorexia nervosa, and, or rather risk for anorexia nervosa, and risk for restricted eating problems is a key feature of the female autism disease type. Further evidence for that proposal uh, comes from studies of autistic traits, so not looking at autistic diagnosis necessarily, but looking at autistic traits. Um, and for example, Heather Westwood, a PhD student in Kate Chanchuria's group at the Institute of Psychiatry, recently completed a, um, an important meta-analysis on this topic, where she uh, synthesized studies which had basically measured autistic traits in populations of people with anorexia using a um, measure called BAQ, you know, this measure by Marcel and Van Cohen and his group. And what they found was that uh, when they pooled estimates across studies, uh, both in adults, 
shown by, by this pool of estimate here, uh, and also in children, there were really very high rates of autistic traits in clinical populations of people with anorexia nervosa. Further evidence for the overlap between the two conditions comes from findings that um, there's a sort of shared cognitive profile between anorexia and autism. So um, an example of that is, is again another meta-analysis by Heather Westwood and uh, Kate Chichuria uh, and um, uh, Matt uh, where they looked at uh, set shifting uh, in anorexia nervosa. So this is a executive function that's well known to be impaired uh, on average among people in autism. And they found that uh, once you pull studies, um, quite, a, quite a few studies have been done on, on these, these disorders and set shifting, you found a kind of moderate effect as, as shown by that poor rest of them there. Um, so there is strong evidence that people with um, anorexia do have trouble with set shifting, uh, as do this, this one here is, is, a, is a, the of equivalent finding people with autism, as of course to people with autism. And actually, there's some evidence that um, there are theory of mind impairments in anorexia, uh, and also a tendency towards a sort of detailed, focused style of processing, so-called weak central coherence. Which again is um, uh, you know, both, both obviously theory of mind bonds and weak central coherence are sort of hallmarks of, of autistic cognition. So again, further evidence that there does seem to be a, a meaningful and real overlap between autism um, and, and anorexia nervosa. Now, before I get too carried away with this, I do want to just sound one note of caution, okay, which is this. When people experience starvation, um, they develop uh, certain psychological characteristics that look a bit like autism. So this was a discovery famously made in the Minnesota starvation experiment um, in which uh, some conscientious objectors wanting to volunteer and do their bit in World War II um, agreed to be starved, uh, to lose 25% of their body weight, and then to be re-nourished uh, and to be studied scientifically throughout that whole process. And what was observed that as these men uh, lost body weight and went into a starvation state, they became less empathetic, um, less socially motivated, they developed focused interests, uh, mostly on food, of course, uh, and they became less flexible in their thinking and behavior. So we just need to be a bit careful here because, of course, uh, one thing that a lot of people with anorexia nervosa have in common is that they are also experiencing starvation, often chronic starvation. And so we need to be a bit careful that when we assign an autism diagnosis to some, someone with anorexia, we're not actually making a mistake and labeling the effects of their starvation as uh, a symptom of autism. And I mean, I would say that um, uh, the evidence is nevertheless there that there are, if you like, true, that there are a great overrepresentation of true cases of autism amongst people with anorexia. If you look at childhood histories, um, if you look at people who've recovered and have learned on the staff, you still get a subgroup who, who do have autism. There's many more than you'd expect uh, in the general population. But nevertheless, I think that 25% estimate of Gilbert, in my opinion, is probably a bit high for these starvation reasons by that line. Okay. So now we're going to move on to our fourth uh, key feature of the female autism phenotype, and this is uh, a greater capacity to camouflage autistic difficulties. Yeah, so what do I mean by that? Let me, let me tell you. So camouflaging here is defined as the masking of ASC behaviors and social situations and or the performance of behaviors to compensate difficulties associated with autism. And it's been beautifully summed up in this phrase from Le uh, Leanne holiday Willey, who is uh, an autistic woman who's, who's written this very famous book about her experiences both pre- and, and post-diagnosis uh, of, of autism. And the title of the book and this phrase that really captures camouflaging is pretending to be normal. And in fact, many autistic people, when they talk about the camouflaging, use that phrase, uh, pretending uh, to be normal. So we're making a distinction when we think about camouflaging between, on the one hand, masking, and the other hand, compensation. But what also seems to become becoming clear is that uh, there are sort of conscious elements to camouflaging, 
and they're more automatic and unconscious ones. And this is something that, that Laura Hull, um, who's helped prepare the seminar, is currently working on um, as part of her PhD. But what is, is sort of emerging from her work is this distinction between masking conversation and also possibly this distinction between conscious and automatic camouflaging. So an example of conscious masking came to me from when I was interviewing a young woman, in fact, with an eating disorder who also had an underlying uh, autism spectrum condition. And she told me that as she'd kind of moved into secondary school, she'd kind of noticed that her stimming behaviours, her kind of tapping and flapping, the things she did to make herself feel relaxed or to express excitement, uh, looked a bit odd and could attract negative attention from peers. And so she made a conscious decision to mask those behaviours, to, to suppress them in public and just to use them uh, in private. An example of automatic or unconscious masking came from a study, I'm actually going to talk about a bit later, by Sarah Bargello and, uh, and colleagues, which is currently um, under revision. Um, and this was a woman who, who, talk, who spoke about the experience of, without even realizing it, just mimicking the people around her in, order to, in an effort to try and sort of fit in and to pretend to be normal. So she spoke about how I do social mimicry against whoever I'm with. I guess it's like a cloaking device. I had no idea that I was doing it until I was diagnosed. Now, before I go on to talk about compensation, I'd like to show you another couple of, of clips. Um, again, because in a general sense, I think they really convey something about the female phenotype, but also because they contain some really thoughtful reflections from the young person um, about the nature of camouflaging and compensation and the impact that that can have uh, on, the, um, on the sort of well-being and life of, of an autistic so, um, again, these are these sorts of longitudinal vignettes. So we're going to start with um, this person when she came to the clinic uh, when she was about 15 um, and, and received a diagnosis on the autism spectrum. And then we're going to meet that person again uh, in their early 20s. So here we go. Can I say anything else what kind of makes you together? Um, I don't know, I mean, I guess we both consider ourselves not like most of the other people in the year. Like, we both get really exasperated at the things that other people who really thick think. Like, in our we spend the whole time just passing notes because we don't learn anything, and it's a DOS subject, and it's common sense, and we spend lessons and lessons going over these things that are just common sense, which people don't seem to understand. So we just, it's quite nice to have somebody else who realises that it's a stupid subject, and it's obvious, and yeah. So you share that to you? Yeah, we just basically don't pay attention because yeah. why would we listen to something? There's no point. You're fond of yeah. I think I talk differently when I'm around them because they're sort of like me and Alice are really separate from everyone else, but they're kind of not. They're like a kind of bridge between me and everyone else. So I kind of talk more colloquially, I guess. Don't try and adjust yourself to, mm. to them. Yeah. And when you say you, you act more normal, what, what do you mean? I don't know. I try to sort of focus on topics of conversation that, I don't know, normal teenagers talk about parties, boys, reckon out with them, drinks, and stuff. But, and I mean, it's not that I don't talk about those things with others, but, but, but I don't talk about them as much, and we tend to talk about really weird stuff that nobody else would talk about, like social hierarchies or stuff like that. Um, you know, species hierarchy. That's oddly specific examples. Those are just things we were talking about recently, but you know, weird, deep stuff. Okay, so that was that was um, a few years ago. Now this person now identifies as having a, a male gender uh, and is called Felix. Uh, but we're going to be hearing from Felix um, about. Some, some further thoughts on, on, the, um, on the female phenotype, and also how, which is a topic we're going to come to um, in a minute or two, uh, how that female phenotype can really impact upon um, a girl or a woman's chances of being identified, chances of, of receiving the kind of understanding and help that they need um, as somebody who's on the autism spectrum. So um, here we have um, the same person known as Felix now uh, talking. 
Two of my cousins have autism, and I don't like the terms high functioning and low functioning because I think they're very based in what neurotypical people think is normal, or like should be normal, and I don't agree with that. I don't think that you can label someone as low functioning because they operate in a way that's noticeably more different than you know the way neurotypical people function. But they are both, you know, more sort of classically autistic, I suppose than me. But my aunt, who's an author and um, writes about them a lot, she wrote a book about them called George and Sam, which came out when I was about nine. And I read that and I kept thinking to myself, that's me, you know, that like that little behavior, like, and obviously I'm very different from them in a lot of ways, but, you know, I would see just little things, little reasonings for things that I didn't, hadn't really thought through. And then it was like, oh, that's, that's why I do that. So, yeah, I, I think I, I kind of knew that I, I, I was somewhere on the spectrum when I was about nine. I think this is a big reason why a lot of um, girls or people who are raised as girls um, don't get diagnosed or get diagnosed much later because um, boys, young boys um, when they're young children have a lot more leniency towards the way they behave and a lot more freedom and, you know, boys will be boys. so. If they're acting up in, you know, or acting out in ways that are striking, then that will be commented upon, but it won't be suppressed like um, in the same way that it is with young girls, because young girls learn from a very young age that you have to be nice and sweet, and you have to be polite, and you have to like hug your auntie even when you don't want to, and you know, you learn that at school, you learn that with just talking to other girls, you learn that from your parents, and so I think young girls with Asperger's learn to act normal from, you know, very, very young ages. And then you, um, you know, you, you, lo you develop a kind of face that you can put on and it is acting and it's exhausting, um, but you can do it. And then you end up not getting diagnosed or not getting diagnosed for a long time because everybody says, well, how can you possibly have Asperger's because you're so, you act so normal and you're so convincingly, you know, normal. Um, yeah, which probably leads to the theory that girls don't get to have Asperger's as much as boys, which I don't think is true. I think they're just diagnosed much less often. And then it's kind of a self-continuing cycle because when the, the suggestion that a girl has Asperger's comes up, they're more likely to reject it because, oh, but, you know, girls don't have Asperger's nearly as much as boys. Okay. So yeah, there are pl you know, plenty of really um, you know, great insights into into the phenotype and, and its impact, and, and also I suppose how it interacts with sort of you know, interesting ideas there about gender as opposed to sex effects and, and so on. But also um, Felix and, and uh, he gave us some good examples of compensation. I mean, another example I've come across a conscious compensation, um, which is um, expressed up here was a, a young woman who had, around about the transition to secondary school, um, she already had a diagnosis of autism actually, had taken a conscious decision to study a particularly popular girl in her class and to really put a lot of work into learning how to imitate her, how she dressed, how she gestured, how she talked. And this girl would go home and practice this stuff in front of the mirror. And I have to say, it, it had worked because by the time I met her, she really, um, had very polished uh, social skills, actually, uh, having been diagnosed with autism in childhood. And then um, in the clip we just saw um, when Felix was younger, we saw a nice example of an implicit learning from social experience, what I would call automatic compensation. You know, it used to take me weeks to figure out what I'd done wrong, but now I know pretty much immediately. Okay, so I'm going to move on now um, from, you know, I've talked about what I consider these four cardinal features of the uh, female autism phenotype. Uh, and really I've been talking about differences in the kind of nature, the type of, of autistic symptoms between males and females. I'd like to just very briefly suggest that perhaps another um, important part of the uh, phenotype is differences not in the type of symptoms, but in the timing of symptoms. And this 
although it's not an idea that's been tested very often, is actually quite an old idea in our field. So those of you who know your, your autism history, perhaps those of you who've read neurotribes recently, um, will know who this is a picture of. It's Hans Asperger uh, in, his, in his famous clinic. And one of the things that Hans Asperger wondered about after he'd, he and his colleagues had come up with this idea of autism um, was why did they see so few females with it? In fact, he saw almost none in his clinic, and he wondered about this. Uh, and one of the things he said was it could be that autistic traits in the female become evident only after puberty. We just don't know. So he's kind of putting forth the idea that maybe autism only really starts to manifest, or certainly strongly enough to generate a kind of clinical diagnosis, after puberty in females. It's more likely to have a sort of later um, emergence uh, in females compared to males. So it's quite a radical idea, uh, quite hard to test in a sense, because what you really need for that is prospective data. You, know, you need to have followed females and males uh, across the lifespan, regularly measuring their autistic characteristics to see whether uh, in, in any of them, but especially in the females, there's this sort of escalation of autistic traits, autistic difficulties uh, with the onset of adolescence. Because this idea would certainly help to understand some missed cases of autism, and it would also help to understand why uh, females with autism receive their diagnosis on average later than do men. So we've had a bit of an initial go at testing this idea using data from a study called ALSPAC. So this is a birth um, cohort study uh, that's based in a, in a town in the southwest of England called Bristol, uh, where they recruited every child born in 1990 and 91 uh, in Bristol and the surrounding areas into this study, and they were um, assessed them repeatedly year in, year out, and in fact continue to assess them to this day. Um, and one of the assessments they did was the social communication disorders checklist, so this short measure of autistic social reciprocity and social communication difficulties, and that was administered at seven, at 10, at 13, and at 16 years. So it gives us a chance to test out this Asperger hypothesis that maybe there's a sort of escalation of autistic risk in females uh, that occurs uh, over sort of late childhood and adolescence. And this, these are our preliminary findings. So here you have a graph that plots the, just the mean scores for males and females on this measure of autistic social difficulties. And we see that plotted at age seven, age 10, age 13, and age 16. And it is interesting that for males, we see this kind of downward slope from um, seven to 10, um, and then um, a kind of flatlining uh, of, the, um, uh, of the averages for at age 10, age 13, and age 16. Whereas for females, um, we find uh, a kind of dip like the males, but then this sort of steep slope, this escalation from age 10 to 13 to 16 of autistic difficulties. So some evidence there. And also, if you kind of look at the data in a slightly different way, if you ask yourself, I'm not just going to look at the average scores in the population, but I want to know what percentage of males, what percentage of females at each age are actually in the kind of high risk group, actually score above the clinical threshold of the SEDC, and therefore appear to have quite substantial levels of autistic traits. And we see the same pattern. Uh, so again, you have uh, the males showing you know, pretty high rates.
starting. So what was clear from pretty much all of the women in the study was that they were invested in pretending to be normal and camouflaging, and that they felt that this had resulted in them not getting recognized uh, as being autistic. So here's one sort of typical quote. The reward for trying hard to be normal was to be ignored because you were acting normal. And I look at the stories online of kids who were going off the rails, and I think, I should have just burned more cars. So um, you know, she's making the point that she was so, so invested in being a good girl and, and, um, and being the sort of normal, quiet kid at the back that actually if she, she'd be a bit more naughty and acted out a bit, she might well have been picked up earlier um, and got the help she needed earlier in her life. So camouflaging seems to be a direct uh, influence on late diagnosis in women. Another um, important theme from this analysis was this sort of sense of diagnostic overshadowing by co-occurring mental health difficulties. So remember I've spoken already about how autism very frequently occurs with other um, difficulties, including mental health difficulties. And so this person here has had four to five years of depression, anxiety treatment, five different antidepressants, years of talking therapy, and not once did anybody suggest I had anything other than depression. So in this sense, in this case, um, she's presented with difficulties and professionals have been aware of that. They've acknowledged that she's struggling, but they've kind of her, her difficulties with anxiety and depression have overshadowed uh, her underlying difficulty with autism. And it was very common in the sample that women had presented to their family doctors, uh, presented at mental health services, and received treatment for their co occurring difficulties, but nobody had noticed the underlying um, autism. Now, these findings here are important because what they show us is that it's not just about the individual characteristics of women of autism that can lead to under ascertainment of females, uh, but also features of the environment. And in this case, the attitudes, the beliefs, the knowledge, the preconceptions of professionals uh, were very influential on them being diagnosed late. So for example, this, this woman talks about teachers. I've always remembered my special needs teacher saying I'm, I'm, I'm too poor at math to be autistic. So there's this sort of stereotype that that teacher had about what it means to be autistic. This kid didn't fit it. As a result, she wasn't referred on from school uh, to receive clinical assessment. And um, other healthcare professionals are also mentioned here. So this person says, when I mentioned the possibility, i.e. the possibility of, of me having autism, to my psychiatric nurse, she actually laughed at me. I asked my mum, who was a GP at the time, so GP is an English word for a, a sort of family doctor, um, if she thought I was autistic. She said, of course not. At the time, a bit 10 years ago now, there just wasn't much information about how girls presented. And from what she knew, I was nothing of the sort. So you know, if we want to understand biases, uh, diagnostic biases against females, we can't just look at the characteristics of females. We need to also um, factor in kind of environmental influences, and in particular, as I've said, I'm talking about here, the kind of the knowledge and the assumptions of various important gatekeepers to clinical services, um, teachers, family doctors, psychologists and psychiatrists working in general mental health settings, uh, and so on. So there we go, some, some, some ideas for us to then go out and test, I think, in a more formal, empirical way about what are the actual barriers to women of autism being identified in a, in a timely fashion. Right, so I'm going to finish off by just considering um, some what I've called here future tasks. So really um, uh, sort of ways in which the field could go in the next few years that would help us better understand um, the kind of needs and characteristics of girls and women with autism. I'd like to do that by highlighting some of the very real sort of conceptual and methodological challenges to doing research in this area. So the typical study of sex gender differences in, um, in autism involves recruiting a bunch of people with autism from an autism clinic and who've been given an autism diagnosis and then comparing the males and the females on gold standard, well validated measures of autistic symptomatology, such as the ADIR, the 3DI, the ADOS. Um, and that's all very well and good, but I would like to point out that there's a couple of real pitfalls with that sort of research. So firstly, 
what we know from our discussions earlier in this session about um, gender ratio in clinics versus in the general population and versus in high trade scorers is that if you're recruiting your sample from people who A, score up according to DSM ICD-10 and B, made into a clinic and were diagnosed, it's pretty likely that you have a systematic bias against some females with autism. And furthermore, you're probably biased against the very females that you most need to be studying, i.e. those who, because they have a female phenotype or perhaps because of cultural attitudes about um, autism and females, have not made it into clinics. So that's a problem, uh, and that's what this diagram um, is talking about here. Um, this idea that if you have these inclusion criteria in a clinic based on DSM, you exclude some of the very cases you most want to see, which just serves them to kind of reconfirm your inclusion criteria. Uh, and so this issue here, this conceptual issue, I would say has caused autism research to consistently underestimate the extent of, uh, of um, sex gender differences in autism. Now a related problem uh, is the use of gold standard measures. So normally in autism research, obviously you would not say using gold standard measures in autistic symptomatology was a problem, far from it. Um, but the trouble is if you exclusively use those measures to try and capture differences between autistic males and females, the risk is that you're going to miss a lot of important stuff. Um, you know, the ADI and the ADOS don't have questions about masking and compensation and camouflaging. Uh, they're not particularly good at capturing special interests if they are quite socially focused. So the risk is that even if you've managed to recruit a sample in which you, you, who are representative of females with autism, if you're just going to use the same old measures that everyone else is using, uh, that measure core symptoms of autism, you're at risk of not capturing their key gender differences and, again, of underestimating the, the true extent of, of gender differences uh, or sex gender differences. In, in this population. So, you know, I've, I've done studies like this myself. I don't wish to sort of be critical of people who've done them, but I think that it's now time for the field to kind of, they've been very useful, but I think it's now time for the field to sort of move past them and to try and find some different ways to get at this question of, you know, are there differences between males and females with autism? If so, what are they? And if so, what impact are they having uh, sort of clinically? So, to that end, I, I, I've uh, emphasize some priorities for future research, um, some ways we might begin to try and um, overcome some of those conceptual challenges I've just mentioned. Uh, so I think measure development is an important one. So we need to develop measures that capture these hypothesized components of the female phenotype. So for example, Laura Hull is developing a camouflaging measure at the moment, and that will allow us then to empirically and systematically test out Firstly, the idea that camouflaging does occur in people with autism and that it occurs more than in the general population. Um, we, we can test the idea that it's more common in females than males. We can look at the consequences of camouflaging. We can measure the impact on diagnosis. So we need to develop measures that actually address our kind of hypotheses about the female phenotype. I think sample selection is important. We need to go beyond just clinically ascertained samples. I think there's a whole group of people out there who don't have clinical diagnosis who are self-diagnosed. Um, I'm certainly not saying that we base the whole field on them, but I think it would be very intriguing to find out who they are, um, to decide whether they really do seem to have autism, and if so, why they haven't received a diagnosis, but why they have a self-diagnosis. And I think also studying people who have not necessarily an autism diagnosis, but high autistic traits will be instructive, because as we've seen from the earlier part of this presentation, um, if you, if you select people on the basis of high autistic traits, you get a lot more females than if you select people on the basis of having uh, a kind of DSM diagnosis of autism. And it may well be that therefore you're getting a more representative tranche, a representative sample of females who have profound autistic difficulties and need to be captured by the diagnostic manuals and, and therefore brought into clinical services and help. And as I think I've emphasized already, um, I think there's work to be done not just at the individual level, looking at sort of individual characteristics, but also looking at the broader kind of professional and cultural context in which people with autism exist and understanding how that could influence kind of gender-based inequities uh, in, in sort of autism care and, and clinical and educational services.
So, it just remains for me to say thank you to all these people here who have been you know, really great collaborators and um, whose ideas I'm you know, often expressing and, 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 uh, and sort of sharing with you today and in other occasions. And so, yeah, so that's my part of the, uh, of the sort of seminar uh, done, and, and I believe now it's time um, for some, some questions. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for a great presentation, Dr. Mandy. Um, your talks definitely stimulated some questions, and so now I'd like to hand over this session um, to Laura Hall, the member of the working group who will be moderating the question and answer session. So take it away, Laura. Thank you, and thanks again, Will, for such a great presentation. Um, so the first question we're going to start with is just asking about the references that you gave for the slide about the sex gender ratio in autism. So that's slides mm. 14 and 15. Mm. Could you talk a little bit about those references and where you got them from? Yes. So, so this is so for starters, the, the Simon Simplex collection is, is obviously a study that's that's um, extensively uh, been. Um, Sort of published on, and if you kind of put Simon Simplex into, um, you know, a Google Scholar or PubMed or something like that, you'll get plenty on that. In terms of the kind of the four to one gender ratio, sex gender ratio that I quoted, I mean, a good place to go for for that. I mean, for starters, that's the, that's the ratio that's quoted in DSM five, for example. But I think the place that most people get that from is from Eric von Bonn's review of um, epidemiological studies in 2009, so I can't remember quite what journal that appeared in, but it's Fonbon, um, it's not et al, it's just him on his own, Fonbon 2009. And then um, in terms of the three to one figure, um, so a good example where you would find that, that ratio of a, um, of a three to one figure emerging from a active case ascertainment um, epidemiological study, so as opposed to a clinical sample or an epidemiological study where they just sort out people who already have a clinical diagnosis, is Gilly Baird's work. Um, so that's Baird et al. 2006, which was published in The Lancet, I believe, very highly cited paper that should probably pop up on Google Scholar if you put that in right at the top, which found a, gen uh, a ratio of three males, so three females. Thank you very much. Next question, um, how soon can we expect to see gender normed and validated assessment tools to help us identify autism? Ah, that's a very interesting question, isn't it? So gender normed, so I suppose that raised, I think there's a bit of a debate in the field there. So, so, uh, so this comes out particularly in looking at SRS data, for example. So this is this very widely used scale derived by Constantino and colleagues for measuring dimensionally autistic traits. And some people have suggested that if you like, the threshold above which you're considered to be in the clinical range should be different for males and females. So in a sense, you could say, let's take the top 1% of males and the top 1% of females. And if you decided to do that, you would be setting different thresholds for males and females. You would effectively be gender norming that measure. And it's an interesting question. You know, is that a good idea? Because what you will end up doing is lowering the, 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 the male to female ratio and including a lot more females in the kind of clinical range. I suppose the way for me to answer that question is to look at those extra females that, that by gender norming that instrument, you would um, bring into a kind of more clinical range and looking at their needs, you know, asking, are these people who, who need to be labeled as having um, autistic difficulties, do they look like people with autism in terms of their needs uh, and so on? So I think once that work's done, we, we could possibly, depending on the data, move to gender norms measures. In terms of changing the content of measures so that they reflect the female phenotype um, more, well, I think we're some way off. I, mean, I think in the next couple of years, well, they'll start appearing in the literature, and I know, I know Laura's doing one, I know several other people who are doing them. The extent to which they become accepted in clinical practice and quite how that would work is, is an interesting one. Um, and I, I'm afraid I can't put a precise date on that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next question, is there the possibility that some similar biases or contextual issues um, that affect the identification of ASC um, ex also exist in other population groups, so racial and ethnic minorities, for example? Mm -hmm. Yes, now I'm sort of conscious that there is a growing literature on this, isn't there? Uh, and as I understand it, that there are, 
I'm, I think I'm right in thinking that there are certain social, economic, and cultural biases that mitigate against people receiving a diagnosis. Um, yeah, but I, I couldn't talk with any real authority on, on that literature, I have to confess. Um, uh, so what was, what was the original question? So just whether there might be a sort of similar bias yeah. thing for racial yeah. or ethnic minorities. And I suppose, because I've talked about two types of bias. I've talked about a kind of diagnostic bias where you have people who basically meet the criteria but don't seem to make it to the clinic. And then I've talked about a kind of nosological bias where people who have a high traits but don't meet the criteria. I would expect the first of those two biases to be most relevant to um, people who are, for example, socially disadvantaged. I think that, uh, yeah, but that's a prediction that could be could be tested. It's a very interesting question. And do you think that there could be some sort of interaction between the gender biases that you've described and the racial, ethnic, social biases that might also exist? Uh, okay, so there could be even greater gender biases in, in certain uh, groups have defined by their ethnicity. Yeah, again, um, uh, perfectly possible. Uh, and I guess you need sort of large-scale epidemiological studies um, to, uh, to uh, investigate that. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, what information is available about the relationship between gender variance or gender dysphoria and ASD? Mm. Um, and do you think that high rates of gender dysphoria within autism and vice versa um, affect screening methods or the tools that are used? Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know, I'm assuming that a lot of people listening are in the United States, but uh, I, I'm sure also there are people from other parts of the world, but it certainly, I don't know what's happening in America, but in England and in the UK, there's a tremendous explosion of interest in kind of non-binary gender and trans uh, and all that sort of stuff. So, for example, with the National Clinic for Children who have gender dysphoria, you know, who feel at odds with their natal gender, um, yeah, birth sex, um, is down the road, and I have colleagues who work there. And pretty much now, every year, the number of referrals they see receive doubles. So it's a huge, expanding issue in the UK. Uh, and what I understand from that clinic is that quite a substantial proportion of people there um, have autism and have high autistic traits. You know? And so um, there's a growing... Um, kind of awareness of that. There is, a, there is a nascent literature out there, so if you put that into PubMed, if you put you know, gender dysphoria and autism, you will find some interesting work there, including some, some quantitative stuff. Um, and what was the second part of the question? So do you think that the high rates of sort of overlap between people with gender dysphoria and people with ASD, does that impact the screening methods, or do they need to be changed in order to reflect that? Yes. I mean, I think of obvious ways in which it would impact on screening methods per se. I mean, I think, uh, I suspect that there are lots of cases of people who have gender dysphoria where um, their ASC is sort of missed, you know, rather in this diagnostic overshadowing way that I, I talked about before. So I suppose you'd want to be sure that if you were working in a gender dysphoria service or you were working with people with gender dysphoria, you had good ways of screening. And of course, a very substantial portion of people turning up at these gender dysphoria services are natal females who uh, are interested in, in transitioning to a, to a male gender. So there, that is going to bring with it the sorts of challenges I've been talking about today, you know, of, of assessing the female phenotype, especially in its more subtle forms in people who are verbally fluent and, and, and more intellectually able. Thank you. It's a really interesting topic. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, is there a way to compensate for the prominence of purposefully or socially appropriate eye contact, given that high-functioning girls um, appear to be much better at this than boys. Yeah. Um, and the sort of follow-up question to that, um, which is somewhat related, is if we're missing girls in early childhood, um, how likely or what are your thoughts that they then start to develop more of a personality disorder um, presentation when they come to clinical services? Yes, it's just, I mean, I was talking to... Um, a young woman just the other day about eye contact actually and she was telling me about how she'd um, deliberately kind of studied it um, in, in rather a scientific way actually and it worked out all sorts of rules about how long you had to hold it and when you could break it and so on and so on so she'd made a real study of it and I, I know males do this as well so I remember a boy telling me you know, that he looked at that space in between the eyes uh, because that was much less uncomfortable and um, but but it kind of gave uh, the impression that he was making eye contact. So quite often these conversation strategies are a sort of 
self to consciously self taught things um, uh, and yeah eye contact is no exception and people quite quite often go about it in really quite a, a sort of clever and resourceful way learning from other people how to how to do that so do you think that we should start to take gender differences in eye contact into account during the diagnostic or screening process yeah I mean this is where we really struggle because we don't have a biomarker for autism. So we get into some quite murky waters because you might say, so if you're going to say, I'm happy to diagnose people who don't have any obvious problems with making eye contact and who have a relationship of friendships um, you know, and who are really socially motivated uh, and so on and so on, but I'm going to diagnose them with autism because they're female. You know, that, that's potentially really problematic because you're at risk of over-diagnosing them, aren't you? And, and, and of sort of creating a whole bunch of people who have this diagnostic label um, when they shouldn't. Uh, so, so it's problematic uh, because we don't have the biomarkers. You can only make the diagnosis on behavioral terms. What I would say from my clinical experience is that I'm, I'm happy to sort of diagnose people if even if they, you know, let's say they come to a session and the eye contact doesn't look uh, abnormal, of course, you know, you don't have to have um, this sort of eye contact to diagnose water. You don't have to score up on every item of the ADOS. But if, but if you then have a conversation about camouflaging, in which it emerges that this is a skill that's been learned carefully, and you get a full story of somebody who found it very difficult at first and then practiced it, then I would consider, in a sense, those difficulties of eye contact from a diagnostic point of view to have been present. So I think a lot of this work in, in diagnosing more subtle cases and uh, the female phenotype it, it involves having conversations with people about camouflaging, about compensation, um, and talking with the person themselves about how their presentation has changed over time and how that's happened. So following on from your mention of biomarkers, um, what future do you see in terms of research in biomarkers for ASB? Um, and do you think we'll need different biomarkers for males and females? Mm. Well, I mean, I suppose the, the, the great challenge with autism biomarkers, isn't it, is, is this apparent tremendous heterogeneity of the condition. And so it's now become almost universal um, for, for people to talk about not autism, but when they're thinking about the sort of the disease entity autism, but the autism, so they talk about it plurally. And this idea that, it, it, you know, there's, there's, um, that there's sort of multiple if you like, underlying atypicalities of brain structure and function that can give rise to a set of behaviors that get you an autism diagnosis. So um, I'm certainly not holding my breath for a kind of clinically um, valid biomarker in the, in the next few years. Hopefully I'll be proved wrong on that one. But I suspect that there's such an issue of heterogeneity with the syndrome as we currently define it, uh, that that's gonna be problematic. You know, perhaps the way to go is this more of this kind of RDOT approach where we almost kind of pull the syndrome apart and look at particular behaviors or particular dimensions of impairment, um, you know, perhaps the inflexibility domain or um, uh, quite specific aspects of social reciprocity and social cognition. And maybe once we define more narrowly um, uh, sort of manifestations, then we have a bit more chance of there being uh, a, a more manageable number of, of biomarkers that could give rise to those manifestations. But I don't expect to be diagnosing people with brain scans and computers um, anytime soon. I, I suspect that the questionnaire will, will live on for quite a while. Thank you. So moving on to comorbidities, um, and in particular talking about internalizing disorders, mm -hmm. would you say that binge eating disorder is another frequent comorbidity for females with autism, similarly to anorexia nervosa? Um, and also, do you think binging could be considered as a type of stimming behavior? Mm. That's a very interesting question. Um, I'm aware, I mean, because I think the thing about eating disorder risk is I suspect there's quite a broad spectrum of neurodevelopmental disturbance that is a risk factor for, for eating disorder. So I know that um, Nadia McCarley has done some very interesting work in this where she's used longitudinal data to look at people <laughs> in terms of their, their um, neurodevelopmental profiles when they're younger, and then to kind of follow them up when they're older and to see where the neurodevelopmental problems kind of predict eating problems. And yet, as I understand it, you know, perhaps this is not surprising, certain sorts of impulsivity and ADHD-like symptoms earlier on can be predictive of binge eating. Um, uh, and um, 
I don't know if anyone's tested their relationship between autistic difficulties and, and in particular these sensory problems and binge eating. I mean, I would say that my impression uh, from just talking to women with eating disorders who, who are also autistic is that quite often the pathways that link childhood neurodevelopmental problems and adolescent eating problems can be quite complex and they can be thought of in the language of, of um, developmental psychopathology as kind of chain effects or mediated by um, a number of things. So, for example, a classic case might be um, a girl who was in primary school who perhaps has some language difficulties, um, has high autistic traits, is rather impulsive and inattentive. Um, in primary school, she kind of muddles along, she gets plenty of structure, she's with kids that she's known ever since she was five. Um, she moves to secondary school, the social environment becomes more challenging, it starts to outstrip her capacities, um, and as a result, she experiences um, you know, low mood, social isolation, low self-esteem. And it could be it's actually those things that are the risk factor for then the development of subsequent eating problems, uh, you know, rather than just being a kind of direct link, if you like, from the neurodevelopmental atypicality to, to the eating problems. So, you know, there are complex chains of events that, that should be tested and modeled in, in longitudinal data. Thank you. Um, now thinking about borderline personality disorders, mm. can you talk a bit about how much we're learning about the sort of uh, correlations or the links between late diagnosis and misdiagnosis in females and borderline personality disorder? Yeah. Now, I have to say, I would love it. If, if anybody knows that there are studies in this area, I'd be very interested for people to send them to me because I'm, I don't think there is a literature on this yet, and yet it's a, an important clinical problem. So our colleagues of mine who work in adult assessment clinics quite commonly will come across women, because it normally is women, who've been kind of done the rounds in personality disorder services and have attracted to them diagnoses such as borderline personality disorder, um, who then come to believe that they have autism, actually. They don't have borderline personality, uh, and then seek out an autism diagnosis. And it's very complex because, of course, if we think about some of the work that's been done on borderline personality, such as by Peter Fonagy and people like that, from an attachment perspective, if people like Fonagy would place difficulties with mentalizing at the very heart of borderline personality disorder. Um, admittedly, uh, he would say that those difficulties really come to the fore. They're not sort of persistent, but they come to the fore in times of high emotional arousal. But you know, if you think of people, maybe then you have difficulties with theory of mind at certain points, uh, quite emotionally dysregulated. You know, we find those problems also in populations of adults with, with autism. So the boundaries are very blurred. You know, once again, we're struggling in the absence of the biomarker. Uh, but I certainly suspect, just from anecdotal evidence, that there are plenty of, of undiagnosed women with autism who have ended up in personality disorder services and, and gaining those personality disorder diagnoses. Thank you. Um, the next question, is the gender bias also seen in severe autism with comorbidities such as intellectual disability and epilepsy? Yes, that's a very good question. So, basically, the gender bias is much less in that population. So, again, um, going back to, to um, male to female ratio, if you look in studies of people with um, so-called low-functioning autism, so people who have intellectual disability, perhaps they haven't developed language after the age of five, that sort of stuff, the, the gender ratio really narrows, and you get a two-to-one um, ratio. And, and that in itself is interesting. I mean, is it because females with intellectual disability are kind of almost like the intellectual disability lowers the threshold at which their underlying risk for autism becomes expressed? Um, or is it just that females with autism who also have intellectual disability are just more likely to get into services, to be assessed, to be picked up, and to, to be seen? But it is true, you know, in answer to that question, that the, the gender differences narrow, oh, sorry, the gender ratio narrows, um, and, um, yeah, and, and certainly to my knowledge, there's less evidence for gender differences in that population as well. Brilliant. So we'll have one more question before we move on to the professional development questions. Um, do you think that females have better outcomes in intervention studies which aim to improve their social communication compared to males? Gosh, again, a very interesting question. I'm afraid I'm going to have to um, just confess my ignorance on that one. I don't know of uh, 
of analyses that have compared male and female outcomes. And I rather suspect that it, I can't think of many trials that would, if you like, have enough females to have the statistical power to test whether female uh, gender moderates treatment outcomes. Um, I suppose maybe that would be a good good uh, topic for someone to do a meta-analysis on to try and get some uh, build some extra power in there. But it's um, it's certainly a, a very interesting question. Thank you so much for all your answers. Um, so now we're going to move on to the section where we ask a bit about you, your um, professional development, your training, and how you've come to be in the position that you are now. So let's start by having you tell us a bit about your training background. So the types of programs that you attended. Um, how did your experiences influence your current work? Sure. So um, I've taken a slightly unusual route to, to my current uh, position in that um, certainly in the UK, I think we have a less, less good system in a way than, than in America, which is when you go to university to study, you, you pick right from the beginning the subjects you're going to major in, and you only study that subject. So um, at May Female, I picked history. I went off to university and studied history. Uh, mostly medieval history, and um, so I'm a history graduate. And then after that, I um, and she became, became interested in psychology from reading Steven Pinker, uh, the evolutionary psychologist and um, and sort of um, psycholinguist. Uh, and so went back to university to do what they call a conversion course. So I kind of converted my history degree by studying for a year and then taking a series of exams with the British Psychological Society. Um, to kind of to give me the status of somebody who had a psychology undergraduate degree. Um, and then I managed to get a job um, as a research assistant at a hospital in, in London called Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is quite a well-known children's hospital um, where someone called Professor David Schoos runs a clinic uh, for people with high-functioning autism. And that was my first introduction to autism. I'd never really didn't think I had any awareness of the condition um, at all before um, I started that job. So I had a job as a research assistant and I very much enjoyed the work and it was a very nice team of people, very nice environment in which to work. Um, and, and it was at that time, for example, that I would hear people talking in, in ward rounds and case conferences about females with autism who'd been missed multiple times as, before they'd come to our clinic and speculating about whether there might be a female particular presentation and so on. Um, so I did that for a couple of years, and then I managed to get on to a clinical psychology training program in London at UCL. So UCL is one of the four clinical psychology training programs in, in London, the biggest one. Um, and in England, we don't, we just have a three-year clinical psychology training. So it's a doctorate, it's called a Declin Sci. But it's not like the American system of having this sort of five-year training where you do a really a full PhD and your clinical training. So um, the English system is much more focused on, on clinical training, partly I think because it's paid for, at least currently, uh, by the English government, basically in order to, to create workers for our National Health Service. So they're, they're less keen to pay people to spend three years doing research because what they really want is people to go out there and, and, see, and see patients. So I did that for three years. And then I um, managed, once I qualified, I managed to get a job working part-time back at Great Ormond Street in, in the autism clinic there, and part-time as a lecturer for a member of staff on the UCL clinical psychology course. Um, so that was a very, you know, I would recommend to anybody who's interested in being a clinical researcher to have some period of your career where you're able to work both in research and also clinical practice, because I think it's a very fertile combination. Um, Yes, yeah, so I did that for a few years, and during that time, I actually did a PhD in my part time, in my spare time, in order to kind of, um, I, I suppose, get that kind of academic credibility, whatever that comes with a PhD. Um, and then, actually, recently, I've become a full time academic because that's probably my my passion really is, is to is to do research into autism, albeit clinically oriented research. And that's that's the point I'm at now, really. Thank you. That's a fascinating journey of how you got here. So we were wondering, um, who would you say has influenced you the most throughout your development and your training? Yeah, well, certainly David Skews I've learned a lot from um, in terms of his kind of views of, you know, because, you know, back when I started, so I got into the autism world in about 2002, and he was talking about um, gender differences, 
intentionality of autism, um, uh, things like that, before they became um, as widely accepted as they are today. Uh, but I think also just generally that team of Great Ormond Street were very influential because it was a bunch of people who were um, you know, really doing the clinical work but very interested in then kind of generalizing that through research, making sense of it, using that to inspire um, re research ideas. So, so just I'd, I'd say you know, it's, it's very important for all of us to, we all are influenced by our kind of, you know, some of our early work environments. Uh, and so I think I was influenced by by that one particularly. And what was a key lesson that you learned early on as a young professional that you think has stood with you until today? Well, I think one thing I, I remember very clearly was um, was writing my first, getting my first first author paper published. Um, was I, you know, I had to put a lot of work into it, and I kept writing it, and I couldn't quite get the argument to work, and I'd go back to my supervisors, and they'd say, you know, I, I don't like this, this isn't working, and I'd feel sort of crushed by it, and I'd have to go away and rewrite it, and then I sent it off to one journal, and it got rejected, and then I sent it off to the next journal, and it was eventually accepted um, there. Um, but I always remember opening the email with the acceptance of my heart, sort of racing very fast. So I think it's important to recognize that you, you generally have to work a lot harder for your early papers than your late ones, so you, you should sort of realize that it's a very valuable learning experience. And I think there's just something about learning how to write a paper, and, 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 and it's a very important process, I think, the reviews. You know, even, even if at the time they can feel rather persecutory or unfair, um, it's very rare, I think, that responding to a review doesn't make a paper better and that you, and you don't learn something from it. So I thought that would be one encouragement I'd like to give to, to the researchers is that, um, you know, don't be put off if, if the first paper takes a while to come because you, you would be inevitably learning a lot uh, whilst you're doing that. Thank you. That's a very useful advice. What would you say has been your most rewarding accomplishment? Yes, well, I think um, I uh, we've done some, some work, again, um, with clinical colleagues where we have designed interventions that respond to particular clinical needs in, in our service. So, for example, we had one instance where we did a, a, a small-scale project where we interviewed kids who'd come to our clinic and received an autism diagnosis. And what was very striking was that one of their parents had tended to find the diagnosis of autism really useful. Uh, and they said, you know, oh, it helps us understand our child better. It's opened doors for us at school. Um, it makes us feel less like we're bad parents. All those sorts of things that parents benefit from a diagnosis. The young people themselves often had gained very little from their diagnosis, and sometimes they'd actually been hit by it. You know, they'd lost from it. So they were quite often felt quite uh, ashamed. They'd been given a, a mental health diagnosis, or they just didn't want to know about it because they just wanted it to be normal. Um, so it was quite shocking in a way that, that we weren't doing enough. We were communicating well with the parents, but, but not with the children. So we designed... Um, a psychoeducation program called Pegasus, a group-based, sort of play-based psychoeducation program for kids. We managed to design it. We got some funding. We ran a randomised control trial, and we and we've published on that now. It's, it's the intervention called Pegasus, and and that was a very satisfying experience because that was a real process of going through sort of identifying a clinical need, and then developing something and and sort of putting it out there. And, and now it's being increasingly adopted in the UK, and I think even. Um, the occasional person in America has been, has been using it. So that was a, a satisfying experience of that kind of doing that research work that, that directly impacts upon a clinical need. Brilliant. What aspect of your training do you most attribute to your current success? Which do you think was the most important? Well, it's... Um, really, I suppose, um, again... I, I found it valuable that I've sort of, although I'm fundamentally a researcher, I've, I've done some clinical training. You know, I think that's been uh, very, very helpful. And I think just having times when I was given the time and the opportunities to sort of learn stuff and to do research, and I think it's very important that if you just give people those opportunities and give them a bit of supervision, um, you know, then, then if they, if they, you know, if they want to do it and, and if they're sort of sufficiently motivated, they will often find a way to do it. And I think that was the case with me. That it, it's uh, that can be a very helpful experience, just being given some time to 
to, to, and the resources to do a bit of research. So many of the people in our audience are early in their research careers mm. and would um, obviously benefit from some advice. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Mm. I think so. One, one of my sort of mentors, a guy called Chris Barker, um, again, when I was feeling very um, sort of persecuted by reviewers after a, sort of an early paper, was, was just said, grow a thicker skin. Um, and I think that is true, that you do have to develop a bit of a thick skin in academia because. Um, you know, like in any field in life, you, know, you will there will be setbacks and things will, won't work out as you want them to, and you know, grants won't get funded or papers will get rejected. So, I think um, that is, is very important. And I think again, um, there's also something where, and you know, one doesn't always manage to do this, but because you know academia is a job and and, you, and there's a kind of targets to be met and you've got to do certain things and, and um, achieve certain things. It, it's important to still remember why you went into it, you know, to try and um, sort of have fun conversations with your colleagues that aren't even necessarily aimed at producing a particular paper or a particular output, but may, maybe go off in surprising directions. Uh, and, um, and just to remember that sometimes you do just have to sort of let your mind wander and, and be curious about things rather than just um, kind of being the kind of the modern academic who's just trying to produce as many papers as possible. What's the one piece of advice that you wish you'd received sooner? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm slightly yeah. stumped by that question. <laughs> I should, I'll have to go away and think about it. Um, I'll ask you another one yeah, while you're on. thinking. See, see if something um, my mind. So it's a good question. <laughs> I just can't think of it. What's uh, one hard-won professional insight that you would pass on to your advisees? Um, well, this actually slightly contradicts what I was saying earlier, but I think do, do um, this is what I always tell Laura, do make sure you publish papers while you're doing your PhD, <laughs> <laughs> because you know, a it, you know, it's, I think it's a very good way of um, getting the work reviewed basically before the viva, uh, and it kind of just puts you out there and puts you in a better position when you're when you're going for your postdoc. So, you, you know, I think I, I do appreciate this slightly contradicts what I said before, but the, the mindset I think in the modern academic is that you want to be putting your work out there. So early career researchers are often in the process of identifying mentors. Mm. What's one thing that makes a trainee stand out as someone that you would like to work with or mentor? Yeah, that's interesting. I sometimes think with supervision, I think of the metaphor of, of playing tennis with someone, where it's much more fun if the other, person, the other person can hit the ball back over the net and preferably hit it quite sort of hard. So I think there's something about you know being prepared to have a dialogue with people, feeling... Not not being too passive, but feeling that this is a sort of a conversation uh, that you're having with the supervisor, rather than um, a kind of them being the boss and just telling you what to what to do. Um, and I think all you know, all supervisors like students who are kind of you know, enthusiastic and and sort of get stuff done. You know, who are able to judge that that sort of line between always in needing to be sort of told what to do versus just being totally autonomous and not, doing, not taking any advice whatsoever. So, you know, but I think generally most supervisors like somebody who kind of brings something of themselves to it and is, and is um, proactive within the relationship. And is there anything in particular about um, clinical trainees that you look for that would really uh, make someone stand out to you? Yes. Um, I think um, thinking of our clinical trainees at, at UCL, one of the things we often like to because they're often very conscientious, hard-working people, but sometimes they can almost, um, I think the risk can be sometimes with people being almost a bit perfectionistic um, and setting themselves very, very high standards, which in the sort of slightly messy world of clinical research can be quite hard to maintain. So I think what I was always looking for, in combination with you know, the obvious qualities of sensitivity, um, of, of the sort of intelligence, uh, and you know, is this, you know, it's almost a friends and family test. I mean, is this the sort of person, if somebody I knew was struggling, would I be happy for them to sit down with them and try and help them? But I think there's something about a, a sort of resilience that we look for that can come from, you know, being prepared to make the odd mistake and then not be too, beat yourself up too badly about it. Brilliant. We'll have one final question. Um, so it's often difficult to juggle work and life responsibilities. Mm. What does the work-life balance look like for you, and how do you manage to maintain that balance? 
Yes, well, um, so I try to work from home a couple of days a week so that um, you can just sort of lock yourself in your study and, and I often find that's quite an efficient way to get through work without having to work really long hours, and particularly for paper writing and things like that. Um, I work a lot on trains, so I've always got my, my computer with me and, and I, sort of, I can use, get on the internet with it via my phone. So I try and sort of nail through the, the, sort of the email tasks or reading drafts uh, so, so use all that time as possible so that you then don't have to then work late that, that, that night. And then I've also, um, sometimes I, I, I sort of take quite a deliberate policy of switching my email off from my phone you know, over the weekend and things because um, you know, otherwise it's all too easy just to be preoccupied with it in a way that actually often isn't especially efficient or effective but just means that work is impinging on your weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking, uh, answering all these questions. It's been a really interesting talk. Um, I'll now hand back over to Marika to wrap up. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is Carolyn. Um, sorry, so Carolyn. we're just <laughs> no problem. Um, I'd like to end the session by uh, thanking Dr. Mandy, the working group, and everyone for joining us live. Uh, video replays are going to be available to INSAR members for the entire six course series, including this one. You can, you can become an INSAR member by, by visiting insar-autism.org. If you have questions or want to get more involved, you can contact the Student and Trainee Committee at studentcommittee at insar-autism.org. We hope that you've enjoyed this session of the 2016 INSAR Summer Institute. Please take a few moments to fill out the comment section after you close um, your ReadyTalk session. We're really eager for your feedback. So join us next week. We'll have Dr. Patricia Howland um, discussing adults um, on the autism spectrum. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.